Well, good evening to you all, my Victory Through Faith Church family and friends. It's me, Pastor Jay. I speak and I decree the blessing of the Lord over your lives. I pray that all is going well with you. And it's my prayer that all will go well for you. We've got a great word for you today. Uh, We're going to start with lesson 12 of our ongoing series, Walking Through Ephesians. Today, if everything goes according to plan, we are going to cover chapter 3, verses 11 through 16. We stopped at verse 10 last week. We covered verse 10, and so we'll pick up today at verse 11. Before we go any further, though, if you've been rocking with me any length of time, you know that we want to make sure that we've got the Holy Spirit involved in what we're doing. So let's go before the Lord in prayer. And let's get in alignment with the flow of God's kingdom. Lord God, I just thank you for another opportunity to teach your word with accuracy and simplicity. I pray that as your word goes forth, it empowers your people through faith. It equips them for service. I pray that we receive wisdom and revelation knowledge. I pray that every person who is exposed to this teaching will receive at least one word from you that they can apply to their lives and experience divine change. So Father God, we give you the floor, Holy Spirit. We ask you to go before us and lead us into the presence of the Lord where we can glean from the Spirit of God and learn what God desires for us to know. So I thank you right now, Lord God, that your will shall be made manifest through the teaching of your word today in jesus name amen 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 well let's get right into it as i alluded we're going to pick up at verse 11 of ephesians chapter 3 and so we stopped at verse 10 and as i've been prone to do i'll read verse 10 as we segue into verse 11 because so much of Ephesians just is a an ongoing flow when you break it down verse by verse sometimes you got to go back up so what you're reading currently can flow cohesively so in verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 3 it says to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And we talked about that last week, so I'm not going to get into that. I want to pick up at verse 11 by saying, according to the eternal purpose, which he, he is a reference to God, according to the eternal purpose, which God purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So let's look at verse 11. I'm just going to share some bullet points that I have from each verse, and we'll walk from verse 11 to verse 16 and then we'll shut it down today and we'll pick up with verse 17 next week if all goes according to plan. So in verse 11, I'll read it again. It says, according to the eternal purpose, which he, referring to God, purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what do we get from here? Well, the first bullet point that we get from verse 11 is this. Human redemption was part of God's divine plan all along. Now that that you can't get that with your own understanding process this or not even process just ponder this the redemption of mankind was always part of god's plan before man was created before the world was formed before he created adam and blew the breath of life into his nostrils god already had a plan a divine plan for the redemption of all humanity. That's what it tells us. It says, according to the eternal purpose, God's eternal purpose, check this out, was accomplished by, in, and through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm. He had always intended to redeem humanity. He knew humanity would fall before Adam and Eve disobeyed in the garden. So what he said is, okay, I understand everything that's going on. I understand everything that's going to happen. I will foreordain my own son, the word, to become flesh, come into the world as a sacrifice for sin so that I can redeem all of humanity back to myself. And all they have to do is accept 
my son as Lord and Savior, and they will be completely and totally redeemed. God's redemption was his plan all along. He didn't, he didn't come up with it when he realized Adam made a mistake. He didn't come up with it when he realized he was going to have to start over besides Noah and his family. He was going to have to start over with just eight people. He didn't come up with it with when David and the kings and the prophets and the judges kept prophesying and speaking to the nation of Israel and they kept falling behind and they kept coming to God and then moving away from God repeatedly over and over again. He didn't say, well, let me see if I can send somebody to help out. Before Adam was formed, God already had a redemptive plan for mankind. He's a logistical genius. You can't get away from it. The more you learn about God, the more you realize just how good and how thorough God is. His eternal purpose was accomplished by in and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So everything God desired to do, every, everything God desires for us to have, everything God desires for us to be is accomplished in, by, and through Jesus Christ, our Lord. For that, I thought that I would summarize that by reading verses. I want to go back up to verse 6. And then I want to read verse 9 through 11 so you can see what we're referring to. Because verse 11 <clears throat> talks about what God had ordained. Again, it says, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Well, what I want to do is go back a few verses. I'm going to read verse 6. And then I'm going to skip to verse 9 and read verses 9 through 11 so we can see what that eternal purpose that he ordained was. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Ephesians 3, verse 6, NLT says, And this is God's plan. Both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body. And both enjoy the promise of blessings because they belong to Christ Jesus. Then when you skip to verse 9, it says, I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. Verse 10 says, God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Verse 11 says, check it out. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus, our Lord. So now we see what the plan was. He wanted to bring both Jew and Gentile into one family through Jesus Christ so that through Christ Jesus, all humanity could be redeemed. Glory to God. He's a logistical genius. Not only that, he's patient. He's kind and he's loving. Do you realize what, what God had to, I don't want to say overlook, but what God had to see and yet not punish at the time because he knew who he was sending? He knew what would take place to redeem humanity because even though he chose the nation of Israel, they were not perfect by a long shot. And so they had some issues. God had some issues with them. God had some issues. Let's not even let's not even just single out the nation of Israel. God had issues with humanity, period. From the very first couple, Adam and Eve presented a set of issues that were that started with Adam and Eve and runs throughout the lineage of every human being. You know what those set of issues are? Sin-based decision-making. Wow. Sin-based decision-making runs rampant throughout humanity. And the only way to be delivered from it and to overcome it is by our unification and our identification with Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God. So let's look at verse 12. Verse 12 says, in whom, now we know when we're going through Ephesians, when we see in whom, that's talking about an in Christ reality. So when it says in whom, our reality in Christ is that we have boldness and access with confidence 
by the faith of him. I'll read that again. I in Christ realities because we see it says in whom. So we know whatever follows in whom is revealing an in Christ reality that every born again child of God uh, partakes in. So in whom or in Christ Jesus, we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. So what do we get from verse 12? Verse 12 tells us this. Listen to this very carefully. Because of what God has done through Jesus Christ and our faith in him, because it's that's good, Lord. I'll slow down a moment and, and I'll, I'll spend some time with this. <clears throat> because of what God has done through Jesus Christ, that's the A side of the coin. That's the head side of the coin. The B side or the tail side of the coin is that and our faith in him. So yeah, God has done everything that needs to be done. God has already taken, look, it is finished. God has already done. That's why he rested on the seventh day because everything that needed to be done was done. Now listen to this. If everything that needed to be done was done, why isn't everything done for us personally? I'll tell you why. Because it's what God has done through Jesus Christ coupled with our faith in him. See, it is our faith in Christ that unlocks what God has already done for all of humanity. Not just for you, not just for church people, for all of humanity. God did it for all of humanity. It's only unlocked through faith in Jesus Christ. So you might be saying to yourself, well, I'm reading in the Bible what God has done and I don't see any of it happening in my life. I ask you this question. Where is your faith? Is your faith in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and through your unification and identification with him, the God man, you have access and confidence to go boldly before the throne of God and inquire of him? Because the word tells us that the promises of God are yes and amen. Who? In Christ Jesus. So everything that God has done, everything that God has prepared is revealed and, oh, that's good. Everything that God has done and everything that God has prepared is both revealed and released through Christ Jesus. And you must have faith in him in order to receive and experience what God has done. So because of what God has done through Jesus Christ and our faith in him, we can come to God with boldness and confidence. Oh, we can say it this way. You don't have to beg. You don't have to beg. There's no need to beg when it comes to God. You don't have to beg to receive from him. He, ah, uh, glory to God. He's already released it. You got to unlock it by your faith. You've got to unify and identify with your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then what God has already prepared, prearranged, preordained before the foundation of the world is released, glory to God, by your faith. In Jesus, everything you need is in Jesus. He's the answer to every question. He's the response to every request. He is the supply to every need. It's Jesus. Whatever it is you need, it's Jesus. It's already been supplied. It's already been revealed. It's already been released. And you got to add faith to what God has already done in order to walk in the fullness of it. Glory to God. When we see in verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access, I want to show you what access means. When we say access, that is a Greek word that means relationship with God, whereby we are, look at this, acceptable to him and have assurance that he is approving toward us. Ooh, glory. My God, I got to say that again. That's hitting me heavy. What does access refer to? Access is the relationship with God whereby we are one acceptable to him and have assurance that he is approving toward us. That means what we do and who we are is acceptable to him and he is approving of us. Why? How? In Christ Jesus, when God sees you, he doesn't see you. He sees Jesus in you. He sees Christ on you. And so he's able to accept you and he approves of you. When God sees Jesus on you, he says to you the same thing he said to Jesus. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom 
I am well pleased. Why? Because I'm pleased with Jesus. And if my son Jesus is in you by the dwelling of the Holy Spirit, then I'm pleased with you. And if I'm pleased with you, you don't have to beg. You don't have to bawl and squall and cry and try to change my mind about it. The promises of God are yes and amen. So when you locate my promise and you realize you're in Christ, my answer to your request is yes and amen. So be it. Hallelujah. We got access. We have relationship with God by which we are acceptable to him and he is approving of us. Glory to God. Glory to God. You, you, do you know what kind of confidence that creates when you know a, a parent approves of what you're doing? You know, we've got Melody and I, my wife, we have three kids, two girls and a boy. And if they are doing the bare minimum, they'll come to us. They'll make requests. Oh, but when report card time comes, <laughs> when birthday time comes, when Christmas time comes, their requests go up exponentially. Why? Because they know you got to approve this because there are extenuating circumstances. There are special circumstances that allow me to ask for what I normally wouldn't ask for. Check this out. Jesus Christ is your exemption. Ooh, you might have said the wrong thing. You might have done the wrong thing. You might have gone the wrong place. You might have hooked up with the wrong person. You might have developed the wrong habits. Check me out. Jesus Christ is your exemption. I know I said it. I know I did it. I know I went there. I know I, I've been with the person I shouldn't have been with. I'm in Christ. And because I'm in Christ, God, I know you love me. I know you approve of me. And I know I got access to come boldly before your throne. And I can talk to you. And I can make some requests. I can make some petitions. And I can boldly receive what you have already supplied in abundance through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You got access. Stop begging. Stop begging. You got access. You can come boldly before God. He's a good, good father. Stop begging. Well, Lord, if, if, if you don't mind, if, if you can see fit in your heart, if it's not, if it's, if it's not out your way, if you don't see, if you don't mind, come see about little old me. No, I come boldly before the throne of grace. God, this is what your word says. The promises of God are yes and amen. You said it. I believe it. That settles it. Therefore, according to your word, I believe I receive and go down the list, baby. His word cannot return to him void. And if you place faith in his word, he'll watch over that word. And he'll perform it in your life. He'll bring it to pass. Yes and amen. I've seen him do it too many times. <laughs> Can't doubt him. Know too much about him. You know how it goes. All right. Let's go. Let's go. Verse 13. Let's read verse 13 and then we'll touch the bullet points from there. Verse 13 says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Again, Paul says, Wherefore I desire that you faint not at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. What is Paul talking about? Well, listen to this. Paul was making it known that his troubles were for their glory. Listen to this. Paul was saying the things that I'm going through is for your benefit. He was talking to the church at Ephesus and he was also talking to every Gentile believer. He said, the reason I'm dealing with persecution, the reason I'm dealing with suffering is because I am preaching the gospel to the Gentiles. I'm not just keeping it in house for Jews and Jews alone. He said, I am spreading the gospel to regions where other people believe the gospel should not go. And because of my mandate to spread the gospel to the Gentiles, the things that I'm going through, the tribulation, another word for trouble, the tribulation and the troubles that I'm going through are for your glory. Hallelujah. Why you say that, Pastor Jay? Because when Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus, guess where he was? Prison. He was in Roman prison for doing exactly what he's been doing, preaching the gospel. You know, Mark tells us that when the word is sown, Satan comes immediately to take away the word that is sown in our hearts. 
And if he can't, wow, that's good, Lord. And if he cannot take away the word that was sown in your heart, he'll try to remove the sower of the word because we know the sower sows what? The word. So if he can't get the word, he'll come after the sower. Mm. So I, I say this by the spirit of God for those that are watching. Victory fam, if, if you're watching this and you're a member of the Victory family, then you need to heed this advice. Pray for your pastor. If you're not a member of Victory Through Faith Church, but you got a pastor and you just fellowship with us from time to time online, listen to me. Pray for your pastor. Pray for your spiritual leaders, because if Satan cannot get the word out of your heart, he'll come at the sower of the word that was planted in your heart. That's what Paul was saying. Hey, the stuff I'm going through is for y'all glory. The trouble I'm dealing with is for y'all benefit. I'm in prison. I'm writing this letter to you right now. He also wrote one to the Philippians, the Colossians, and he wrote Philemon. Those are what we call prison epistles. Paul was in jail when he wrote these letters. He said, the stuff I'm going through is for y'all glory. I'm not going through this because I've done some wretched thing because I'm so bad and I'm just... I'm the worst of the worst, and, and they're punishing me for what I've said and done. He said, no, I am dealing with the trouble I'm dealing with because of the mandate that God has given me to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And, and I, I believe I could go so far as to say, and if Paul could say so, he would say, and I don't mind doing it. And I don't mind doing it. If this is what God wants me to do, I glory in what he has called me to do. Amen. Now, out of verse 13, let me show you something we learned. Now, he said, my troubles or my tribulations are for your glory. I don't want y'all. Now, notice this. He's the one in jail and he's telling them, I don't want y'all to faint. <laughs> Paul was something else, boy. He said, wherefore, I desire that you faint not. I don't want you to faint at my tribulations. I'm the one going through the Hades and I don't want you to faint. I don't want you to quit. I don't want you to give up because the stuff I'm going through, the tribulations I'm going through, the trouble I'm having is for your glory. That's so powerful. In other words, he was saying, don't let what I'm going through disrupt what you need to get to. That's good. Don't let what I'm going through disrupt what you need to get to. There's a place you got to get in God and you can't let what others are dealing with disrupt your journey. You got to go where God wants you to go. Amen. Now, what do we learn from this? Uh, this is key. And then I move on to verse 14. What we learn here is that even when our own personal situation is less than ideal, we can still bless, encourage and uplift other people. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Listen to this. Even when your own personal situation is less than ideal, Paul's in jail. He's in Roman jail. He ain't, he ain't in club fed. It ain't just a, a, a walk in the park. He's in prison. And you would think in prison, he'd be depressed. He'd be angry. He'd be mad. He'd be like, God, you call me and this is where I end up. No, 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 no. He was glad to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he didn't mind where it took him because he know anywhere it takes me, God got me. Listen to this. If you serve the, if you serve the Lord with all your heart, Anywhere serving the Lord takes you, God, listen, let me get a little closer because I don't know if you hear me. If you serve the Lord God with all your heart, anywhere the Lord takes you, he's got you. For Paul, he knew even though I'm in prison, God's got me. So don't faint in my trouble. Don't faint in my tribulation. I'm focused on blessing y'all. I'm focused on encouraging you. I'm focused on uplifting you. Paul was saying, hey, my trouble shouldn't trouble you. I want you to be uplifted. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to push forward. Amen. And we can do that sometimes in our own personal lives. Maybe somebody we know that's close to us, a family member, a friend, a, a co-worker is going through a troubling time and we take on the weight of their trouble. We, talk, we take on the weight of their struggle. You're not called to do that. You're not called to do that. You better run your race. You can pray for them. You can intercede for them. If the spirit of God tells you to do a certain thing, hey, come alongside and help. But don't take on the anxiety. Don't take on the fear. Don't take on the worry of what they are going through because it doesn't benefit them nor you. It doesn't help their situation and it only weighs you down. Don't faint at others' tribulations. Press forward in the things of God and maybe God can speak to you to help that person come out of what they're dealing with. But there's no need for both of you to be weighed down by the tribulations 
of one individual. Glory to God. No matter what your own personal situation is, even when it's less than ideal, you can still bless, encourage, and uplift others. Really, when you think about it, that's what you ought to be focused on. Let's say your marriage isn't where you want it to be. Your job, your employment situation is not where you want it to be. Your health situation is not where you want it to be. Okay, bless, encourage, and uplift somebody else in their marriage. Bless, encourage, and uplift somebody else in their relationship. Bless, encourage, and uplift somebody on their employment journey. Bless, encourage, and uplift somebody concerning their health. Because when when you sow those seeds of blessing, when you sow those seeds of encouragement, when you sow those seeds of uplifting, you'll reap a harvest of the same. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's good. Thank you, Lord. Let's look at verse 14. Verse 14 says, for this cause, I like this. For this cause, I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we see here, let me show you something. Let me show you something. What we see here is Paul beginning to introduce the prayer for the Ephesian believers that we often quote and we often recite. And it's a great prayer. I do it all the time in my own personal life. I want to show you something. When we pray, and this might seem simple, you might be like, Pastor Jay, I already know that. Every believer should know that. Well, you know, you can know something without really knowing it. Listen to what Paul says here. He said, for this cause, I bow my knees that... Paul is referring to the prayer position. When he said, I bow my knees, he's, he's referring to, I pray. You can read it that way. For this cause, I pray. He says, I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what do we get from here? When we pray, we pray to God through Jesus Christ. Let me say this, and this might rock your world. I'll, I'll, I'll share what I mean when I say it. We don't pray to Jesus. Jesus has never told us to pray to him. All throughout the Gospels, Jesus said, pray to the Father. Pray to the Father. Pray to the Father. This is how you pray. Our Father in heaven. We don't pray to Jesus. Now, you might be saying, well, Pastor, God, Pastor Jay, Jesus God too. Yeah, I know. I know. But you don't pray to Jesus. You pray to God. In Jesus' name. We pray to God through Jesus. Well, Pastor Jay, that makes no sense. If it, if Jesus is God and God is God, does it matter? Yeah, it matters. If you want things released, you better be talking to the right somebody. There are some things that I have to request from my wife that I can't talk to my kids about. And so if I want, if I want what only my wife can supply, I'm not talking to my kids. I'm going to the source. I'm going to the source. I'm going to the source. When you need something from God, you need to go to the source. Now, praise the Lord because of Christ Jesus. We got access to the source, but we don't pray to Jesus. We pray to God through Jesus Christ. Let me show you something. Jesus Christ is the door that grants us access to God. Okay. Because of Jesus, we can pray to God and be heard. I'll say that again. It is because of Jesus that we can pray to God and be heard, but we don't pray to Jesus. We don't say, well, Jesus, I, in Jesus' name, I pray, Jesus, that you would, no. Lord God, I pray that you would bless me exceeding abundantly and above all that I can ask or think according to your power that works in me. I believe I receive it in Jesus' name. Now I know it's solidified, it's certified, it's blue check verified in the spirit realm because I said in Jesus' name or in the name of Jesus. John chapter 10, let me show you. I said Jesus is the door. I want to give you some text to back that up. John chapter 10 verses 9 and 10. We always read verse 10. We don't always look at verse nine, though. Verse nine says Jesus is, is the one we're referring to. He says, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. Verse 10 says the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Jesus said, I'm the door to life. I am the door to life. So when you pray to God through me, you get access to everything God has and everything God is because he entrusted it to me. But you got to go through or however you have to go through me to get it. It seems like a simple statement to make. Well, of course, we pray to God. No, no, no. 
because you need clarity. We need clarity. You'll be surprised that some people are asking Jesus to do things when you're supposed to be talking to God. Oh, Lord Jesus, I just want you to do this. And Wait a minute. He said, pray to the Father. The Bible says you can pray to the Father in secret, and what you pray in secret will be rewarded openly. We're supposed to be praying to God in Jesus' name. Got it? Get it? Good. All right, let's move to verse 15. Verse 15 of Ephesians chapter 3. Now, verse 14 says, For this cause I bow my knees, I pray unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So I want to touch this real quick before we get into 16, and we'll stop there. When it says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, what that means is that whether in heaven or on earth, all saints, Old Testament saints, New Testament believers, same deal. Anybody who in the Old Testament, they were looking to a Messiah. They were looking to a Savior and their faith in the Savior to come grants them access into heaven when he came. For us as New Testament believers on the other side of the cross, when we look to Jesus and what he has done and who he is, we too become saints. When we give our life to Jesus Christ, we become believers. We become saints and we are all one family in Christ Jesus. So whether in heaven or on earth, because remember, when Jesus rose from the dead, he transplanted paradise into heaven. Before when you die, before Jesus took the cross and was buried and resurrected, when you died, you went to hell either way. And there was a, a compartment in hell in called uh, paradise. You remember Abraham or you remember uh, uh, Lazarus? And the rich young ruler or the, or the ruler that died, the man that was clothed with purple and fair sumptuously every day. He wasn't the rich young ruler, but he was rich. He was wealthy. And Lazarus was a beggar and they both died. And the ruler or the rich man opened his eyes in hell. And then uh, Lazarus opened his eyes and he was in paradise. And there, there was a gulf between the two. The rich man was still barking orders from hell saying, hey, send Lazarus. So he can give me some water and my tongue is parched. And he said, no, ain't nobody doing that, bro. And even if we wanted to, there's a gulf fixed between us where those in hell can't come over to paradise. And those in paradise called the Abraham's bosom. And those in paradise can't come over to hell. Well, when Jesus rose from the dead, he transplanted paradise from hell into heaven. So now when a believer transition, when a believer dies, they go to heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. So whether in heaven, those that have already transitioned, whether saints of the Old Testament or new believers that transition before Christ comes back or on earth, those that are still walking the planet right now, all saints are one family in Christ Jesus. You're one family with Abraham. You're one family with Isaac. You're one family with Jacob. You're one family with Moses. You're one family with Noah. You're one family with David. You're one family with Jeremiah. You're one family with Isaac. You're one family with all the Bible characters that we know about that, that were waiting for a savior to come because Jesus unifies us all. We are all one family in who? In Christ. Because family means, listen to this, that Greek word family, it means lineage running back to a progenitor or a progenitor. What does that refer to? It means a forefather. So we all find our lineage and our connection to God because he created humanity. He created man, actually created man in his image and in his likeness. So lineage of family is a reference to lineage running back to a progenitor, a forefather, God himself, our ancestry, and because of that, we are one nation under God. Listen to this. In Christ Jesus, indivisible. Glory to God. We are one family. One body. Many members. Many, many applications. Many uses. But one body, nevertheless. Amen. Praise God. That's good news. The whole family in heaven and earth is named in him. Christ is the great unifier. We might disagree on, on type of music. We might disagree on how we should pray. We might disagree on what day of the week we should worship on. We might disagree on how elements should be 
partake or taken part of, one thing we cannot disagree on is who unifies us. We all have to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's how we become part of the family. Amen. All right, let's look at verse 16, and then we'll shut it down. Okay, so now Paul says in verse 14, I pray for this reason. In 15, he says, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So in 16, this is actually the beginning of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And he, he says, this is what he's praying. He said, I, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. Again, this is the, this is the actual beginning of Paul's prayer. He said in verse 4, 14, for this cause I pray, I'll bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's describing who our Lord Jesus Christ is, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is, is named. Then in verse 16, the prayer begins by saying that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. What are we talking about here, Pastor Jay? Well, let's break it down and then we'll lock it down. This is actually the beginning of Paul's prayer for the Ephesians. And what he's showing us is that whatever God does for us is always according to his riches and glory. Okay. Whatever God does for you, whatever God does for me, it will always be <clears throat> according to his riches in glory. Not our riches, his riches. God doesn't meet our needs based on our supply. You got to catch this. God meets our needs based on his supply, his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, 19 talks about that. My God shall supply all your need according to what? His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. So you got to catch this. God doesn't meet our needs according to our supply. God meets our needs according to his supply, his riches in glory. And he does it by Christ Jesus. Mm. Now, his riches in glory are made available to and accessible through our unification with Jesus Christ. The reason we can tap into the riches of, of God, the reason we can tap into his riches in glory is because we are unified with Christ Jesus. Remember, he's the door. He's the door to what? God's riches in glory. God's riches in glory by who? By, through, and in Christ Jesus. So because you are in Christ, you have access and availability to God's riches in glory. And we know if it's God's riches in glory, they're spiritual riches, which means they have to be transferred into the physical natural realm by what force? By the force of faith. Because faith is an invisible force. It's a spiritual force. And when it is used, it becomes the thing that you are believing for until the thing that you are believing for shows up. If you can see it, you don't need faith for it because you have the thing. Faith is for the things that cannot be seen. Ergo, faith is for the spiritual resources. So the spiritual resources can become material resources in the same way that in the beginning was the word and then the word became flesh. Well, the same way, whatever need it is you have, is already supplied in God's spiritual riches. And you have, you have to add faith to that in order for it to become the natural manifestation of what you need from God. So let's define a few of these terms and we'll, we'll probably lock it down in the next few minutes. Uh, when we read here where it says he would grant. In verse 16, pray that he would grant you. He would grant is actually one Greek word that means to supply or furnish with necessary things. So if it's necessary, God's got you. <laughs> if it's necessary, God's got you. If you need it, he'll furnish it. He'll supply it. How? According to his riches and glory. By who? Christ Jesus. So you got to be connected to, unified with, and identified with Jesus in order to receive everything that God has laid up for you. He would grant means he will supply and he will furnish with necessary things. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because he's with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table. He prepares a table. He prepares a table. He prepares a table. Where is the table getting sourced from? Where are the resources for the table coming from? His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Glory to God. Now, back in verse 16 of Ephesians 3, it says that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory. We're talking about that already. To be strengthened. To be strengthened means to be made strong and to increase in vigor. So God wants you strong. He doesn't want you weak and beggarly. He wants you strong. Strong in the Lord. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Who grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. That might, the word might, M-I-G-H-T, that is the Greek word dunamis. It means inherent power. It means miraculous power or power for performing miracles. So God wants you to be strengthened with miraculous power to perform miracles. Why? Because I don't want you limited to the natural realm, said the Spirit of God. I want you to be able to do whatever it is I tell you to do, to go wherever I tell you to go, and to have whatever I tell you you need to have, and I'm willing to perform the miraculous if that what it, if that's what it takes for you to get it. Glory to God. I release the dunamis over your life to walk in the fullness of the riches of my glory. Amen. We have, if might is referring to inherent power, where is this power coming from? Well, it tells us in verse 16, it says that he will grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might. How? By his spirit in the inner man. That inherent power is the indwelling Holy Spirit. In other words, Holy Spirit is our dunamis. Because Holy Spirit dwells within us, we've, we've got the power we need to do the miraculous things that are necessary for God's riches and glory by Christ Jesus to be made manifest in the earth realm. Now listen to this. Now more than ever, we need to plumb, P-L-U-M-B. That just means to explore or experience. But I heard plumb the depths. So I got to say what I heard. Now more than ever, we need to plumb the depths of this inherent power that every born again child of God carries and possesses. God wants us to plumb. That's what he, that's what he spoke to my heart. We need to plumb the depths of this dunamis power that every born again child of God possesses. Plumb means to explore or experience. And I believe that that's God's will for our lives in this day and age. It's always been the will of God for his children now more than ever before because the love of men is growing cold. And with us carrying inherent power within us, we're portable power stations. Wherever we go, the power of God should be released in that environment, in that situation. And so more than ever before, God wants us to plumb, to explore, and to experience the depths of this dunamis power that we carry through the Holy Spirit dwelling in our spirits so that we can tap into the riches of God's glory and receive everything we need to complete every assignment that he's given us to give. I release that over your life right now in the name of Jesus. I declare in the name of Jesus Christ that you will receive everything you need to complete the assignment that God has given you. Every resource you need, I speak it into your life right now in the name of Jesus. Every Thing, every witch, every warlock, every power, every principality, every ruler of darkness that has been working against you to keep you from accomplishing the God-given assignment that he gave you, I declare right now that they are nullified and that the resources of God's kingdom are being released over your life to accomplish the work that he pre-planned for you to accomplish before the world was even founded. I release my faith to agree with those that will receive that and I declare that it's gonna be, a, hey, soon, soon, glory to God for my victory fam. Y'all remember Sunday? Soon, sooner than you think, everything you need 
is abundantly supplied. Not will be. I speak that by the Spirit of God. Sooner than you think. The text doesn't match grammatically, but that's what I'm hearing. Sooner than you think, everything you need is abundantly supplied. Glory to God. I got to stop right there. I'm done because I can keep going and going. Hey, I love y'all. I speak and I release the blessing of the Lord over your lives. Remember this. You are empowered by faith. You are equipped for service and your success is in God's word. I love you. Be blessed in Jesus name.